you guys have questions about your dogs and cats, and I have answers. In this segment of Entering Secrets, I'm going to be doing a Q&A. This is Dr. Andrew Jones. On my YouTube channel, I discuss natural pet health and wellness. And if you like what I'm talking about, I'd love it if you would click over there and subscribe to my channel. So you guys, the first couple questions comes from Denise and from Jackie. They're kind of related. I'm kind of group them to get as many questions in as possible. Um, Denise is asking, I'd love to know how you can get rid of a, a lipoma or a benign fatty tumor on my Yorkie poo. Um, the second person, Jackie, says, um, thanks for all you do and all that you give. I have a 17 and a half year old dog who has a bunch of sebaceous cysts. Is there any way of getting rid of them? It, they come out whenever she gets her teeth cleaned or is put out under anesthesia for any reason. Thanks, Jackie. Um, first, you guys, a, a couple points to make. First, the lipomas or these benign fatty tumors, these lumps and bumps, typically occur, occur in our medium to larger breed dogs. Um, not necessarily like little Thule here, but pretty common here along the chest wall. And you'll feel them sort of soft, movable, fatty lumps. The sebaceous cysts themselves are more likely, you know, imagine a cyst on your on yourself. It could be a benign swelling, often on the head, um, it could be here on the side of the skin, um, and they've got a blocked duct. So they're normally secreting this fatty tissue that keeps the hair nice and shiny. The duct blocks up, all of a sudden you'll see this cyst swelling, and it can also sometimes break open and ooze kind of a, a fatty, almost kind of cheesy type material. So what can you do for these lumps, these bumps, these cystic things that can occur on our dogs and our cats? Um, a couple of the basic things in combination. First of all, if you're seeing them pop up after something like surgery, surgery, a dental cleaning, I mean, that's showing that the immune system is partly suppressed. Boom, they're allowed to show up. And that can uh, equate to lipomas. That can especially equate to these sebaceous cysts. So the couple big principle here is, here is First of all, keeping the immune system as strong as we can and giving it thing to sort of boost the skin immune system. The two big things I find that can be really helpful with is, is selenium and vitamin E. The vit vitamin E dose is 100 I use per 10 pounds of body weight daily. I find it can be really helpful. You can also put that on topically as well as giving that orally. The second thing that I point you towards uh, stimulating your dog's immune system uh, depending you deal with those fatty tumors, maybe deal with those sebaceous cysts, is colostrum. The other big benefit col of colostrum is we also know that it can increase metabolic rate, um, increase lean muscle mass, decrease, potentially shrink the size of some of these fatty tumors. Um, so when we're looking at colostrum doses, we're looking at 100 milligrams for 10 pounds of body weight given daily. A couple other just basic principles I want you guys to consider. First of all, just feeding less kibble, more of a natural type diet. And then the last big thing to consider in terms of a supplement, we do using something like green tea. Um, we know there's certain ingredients in green tea that seem to promote, um, at least help speed up metabolic rate. Um, if we're looking at giving green tea to our dogs, for instance, we'd be looking at making giving about a quarter cup for 10 pounds of body weight daily. So the next question it comes from Mary. Um, she has, says she has a small little Maltese rescue from a puppy mill, and he has continuous eye, effect, eye infections that really bother him. Says she's tried everything from washing his face daily, give him antibiotics, and he still gets them. Do I have any ideas that can, that's going to help this little guy? They're going to be super appreciated. First of all, thanks, Mary, for asking the question. So my biggest suggestion is you probably have a little dog that has obstructed or blocked tear ducts. And I think primarily this can be as a result of the immune system going ahead attacking those tear ducts and they close right over. So meaning that when you're getting this constant tearing, it's probably got staining in both corners of the eyes. And as a result of that, first of all, the eyes aren't protected as well. They can get continue inf infected. And secondary, you're gonna get sort of that brown staining in the corner of the eyes. So here are my thoughts. The first big principle is just really hot pack them, which meaning just using a hot cloth, you know, applying to the inside corner of the eye, you know, hot enough they can touch your skin, but not too cool. Let it cool down, do that five minutes twice a day. Sometimes that's enough to just sort of break open that duct, so loosen them up so it can start draining properly again. The second big thing is topically, there's a couple different options that you could look at for eye infections. Um, I just like 
The one I really like is primarily is cool black tea. You can just make that daily, put five to ten drops in that eye, three to four times a day. Um, you can look at adding in honey, so in, in a combination of the black tea and honey. And the last one I've, I've found to help, and I've had a number of different pet owners write in and say that it's working, is the probiotic. So those are those good bacteria uh, that tend to colonize the intestinal tract. And for whatever reason, there seems to be a, a correlation with the probiotics and what's being ingested. Um, I think it's altering the bacteria that are present with, within uh, the tear ducts themselves and within the discharge of that eyes. Because there seems to be less tear staining, uh, less tear discharge, and some pen owners of that seem to found that it seems to reverse uh, all that those secondary eye infections. Um, so you can get, get the probiotic separately. Um, you're looking at at numbers called 100 CFUs or colony forming units for 10 pounds of body weight daily. Um, so you can get those probiotics in my supplement, uh, an ultimate canine, um, if you've got, got a cat that's got the same thing, an ultimate feline. So our third question comes from Jan Alt. First, I know Jan, she used to host me uh, at least once a month on her radio show in Indiana. First, hi to you, Jan. Um, she's a wonderful person who's just donated so much of her time uh, for animal welfare. Jan's question. Uh, first of all, Doc, this is a wonderful idea to fuel questions from your mil millions of followers. Thanks, Jan. I don't have millions, uh, but I do have a few thousand. My question, I have a private rescue in home with several kitties aged 1 to 17 years. Is it safe to use tea tree oil on my little doggy sweetie pie when she sleeps with my kitties and me in the bed at night? Um, I know tea tree oil can be deadly from personal experience. Um, animal lover Jan. First, great question, Jan, and thanks. So the big thing about tea tree oil is, yes, it's an effective essential oil. Um, it's great as an antiseptic, as an antibacterial. Um, the concern with tea tree oil is that if it's just given in a diluted form at 1 to 2 percent, it's generally considered safe. Um, there's two issues here. First of all, with our cats in particular, they have a different form of metabolizing uh, many of the medications, inc including the essential oils. Um, they don't have the same enzymes within their liver. So just small amounts can be fairly toxic to them. And our animals love to groom themselves. So you put it on topically, they'll start to groom themselves, ingest that. Um, their liver, liver metabolizes it and it can be toxic. If it's given in a diluted form, sort of one to two percent, just lightly misted uh, on your dog, um, and then use a flea comb to spread it through, that could be completely fine and safe. Um, I would be just generally cautious. And, and as a principle, I just avoid it for using it in cats. And I would look for some of the more natural type alternatives that I know can be safer, you know, such as something like diatomaceous earth, um, just sticking with the shampoos. Um, if you have a serious, serious, crazy big outbreak and you're for, forced to use an insecticide, so be it, but try to make that a sort of a one-time thing. Um, the one essential oil that I've seen in some of the other natural flea and tick sprays uh, is using cedarwood oil. Regardless of any type of essential oil, if it's gonna be used topically, make sure it's diluted down one to two percent, lightly misted, using a flea comb, avoiding it on your cats. Our next couple questions, they come from one from Sherry. Um, who had a question about her dog that has dog pancreatitis and the best way to treat that. Um, and then Joanne specifically put in a question and it says here, she goes, um, can you do a segment on pancreatitis in cats? So I'm going to combine those, I'm going to separate them, give you guys a better understanding. First of all, what is pancreatitis? Is inflammation in this organ called the pancreas. Um, sort of located just in here in, be in behind the rib cage, um, tucked up in here behind the stomach. And the pancreas has two big functions. First, it's secreting the digestive enzymes in terms of, you know, that's what's helping breaking down things such as the fat, secreting those into the intestinal tract um, via a duct. Um, secondarily, it's producing a couple of pretty key hormones, primarily uh, responsible for blood sugar regulation and storage. Um, so it's secreting insulin and glucagons. We're thinking of these guys that are diabetics. So it's two big principal functions. When we're saying that there's pancreatitis, we're saying that there's inflammation that, of that pancreas. And that's primarily causing intestine-related symptoms. So most of the time when we're thinking about a dog and in veterinary practice, we always related it to dogs. These guys comes in, come in, they have this really sort of big stomach or abdominal pain. 
they're vomiting, they're not eating, they might be drooling, they're really, really sick. Um, and it's pretty classic going on with that vomiting, and there's a pretty easy veterinary test. So most of the time in the dogs, we equated, equated it to a high-fat meal. Um, when we're looking at pancreatitis in cats, it's very different. In terms of most of these guys, they can just sort of have waxing and waning symptoms. Most of the cats are not vomiting. They might not even have abdominal pain, um, but they may have a fever. And there's just, you know, they go over, they're not eating, they are eating. This waxing and waning disease. So they're very, very different diseases when we look at a dog, when we look at a cat. Although we're looking at the same organ that's responsible for, you know, the breakdown of, of fat in particular, is also secreting those two hormones. So first of all, the big principle in our dogs, um, in terms of both treating acute pancreatitis and long-term prevention. If you've got a dog or a cat who's acutely sick, they're not eating um, and they're vomiting, first of all, go see your veterinarian. But if this is something that's more chronic and ongoing and you, you know you've got this diagnosis, I want to give you some basic principles then to look at in, in terms of what you can be considering to do at home. So first of all, a dog acute pancreatitis, we're not going to give them anything we're going to for 12 hours. Offer fresh water, no food at all. Um, secondly, we're going to look at the basic principles of pain management. It's really painful, so they need something for pain. Um, so your veterinary may give some type of narcotics. Um, you may be able to look at something so, sort of topically, you know, such as topical frankincense. Um, third, these guys need to be given additional fluid therapy because they get clinically dehydrated. The additional fluids is going to help decrease the inflammation of that pancreas. Um, so if you're not able to go to your veterinary practice and have IV fluids, consider doing something such as sub-Q fluids. And you look up there at that link there, I've got a link to show you how to give sub-Q fluids at home. Fourth, with our dogs, consider a uh, in particular, a primarily a high protein, low fat diet. We're trying to eliminate the things that are stimulating the pancreas. So long term, we're gonna feed as low a fat diet as possible. Um, I'd also encourage you to cut out as much carbs as possible, primarily an animal-based protein. And the last thing I think is important with these dogs in terms of long-term pancreatitis prevention is getting that good bacteria back in that intestinal tract, taking away that source of anything that can potentially, you know, climb up the pancreatic duct and flame the pancreas once again. So the good bacteria, meaning the probiotics, um, and the one that's most important is lactobacillus acidophilus. And we're looking at doses of 100 million CFUs per 10 pounds of body weight given daily. With our cats, it's really different. Uh, first of all, the, the number is about 40% of cats that have a condition called fatty liver or hepatic lipidosis. Pancreatitis is the underlying cause. And then we're delving into pancreatitis itself. We think that most important in cats is that relation with IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. So if we can normalize the bowel, that, in, that inflammation going on, say, within the duodenum, um, then we can secondary help sort of decrease the signs and symptoms and help treat the pancreatitis. So what that means is, is first of all, really modifying that diet. Um, if we've got a cat that has pancreatitis, we're trying to get them on an, an animal, more canned food, animal-based protein, virtually no carbohydrates. Um, the difference with cats is we want them to keep eating. We know that in the pancreas, the intestinal tract is gonna heal faster if food is going through it. So it's not like dogs. You don't wanna stop them from eating at all where you hold, fast them for a period of time. They need to have food going through them, but it's the right type of food. Third, we're trying to decrease the inflammation uh, within that bowel, which is secondary decrease inflammation uh, within the pancreas. In veterinary practice, they'd be looking at giving something like some type of steroid to decrease gut inflammation. Um, in a more holistic type option, you could look at something like curcumin. So it would be 100 milligrams per 10 pounds daily of the 95% curcuminoids given orally. Um, next, you want to look at some type of the good bacteria to recolonize that intestinal tract. So once again, you're looking at those probiotics, ideally sort of a, a mixed probiotic supplement. Our cats also seem to respond well to the oral antacids. It's the one I, I like the best that you can give over the counter is Pepsid or Famotidine. You're looking at about a quarter of a 10 milligram tablet um, per cat given twice daily. And the last thing for you cat owners watching out there is considering also adding in the digestive enzymes as a form of supplement. Um, Maybe not necessarily that important for dog owners, uh, but seems to be more important for the cats that have re recurring bouts of pancreatitis. The other couple of points I want to make is one, they think there's a trigger with the organophosphates. 
So that's a type of insecticide, often in those flea collars. There's a correlation with that in pancreatitis. Make sure you don't have flea collars on your cat. And lastly, if you've got a cat that has recurring bouts of pancreatitis, they can come, or these guys that have IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, they can become deficient in vi vitamin B12. And that's a pretty key vitamin that's necessary to make uh, red cells, or these red blood cells. So that if they're deficient in B12, they can actually become clinically anemic and then very weak. The only real way to then supplement that your cat accordingly is given is to be able to give them vitamin D B12 injections. But that's something that your veterinarian can teach you and you'd be giving your cat those B12 injections uh, at home. Okay guys, so in the next question it comes from Beryl. She said, we had two dogs, but the older we just lost to a heart growth. The younger dog is eight and has never been alone. And now he's got anxiety around one be being alone, being any time they try to drive that vehicle. And so what they're describing is a really anxious dog. And it makes sense. He's got his best buddy, the whole world's been shooken up, and he's like, you know, these little things just trigger me now. And, you know, I can speak from personal experience, as probably you guys can too. Like, so, so what can you do to sort of make his brain more settled, make his life more easy, more predictable? And sometimes just certain things set us off. But there's a couple different, you know, things you can think about using or actually doing and sort of helping your sort of anxious guy. First of all, there's a supplement I really love, like called L-theanine. Um, it's a natural kerning amino acid found in green tea. Um, of all the different ones I'm going to talk about, I think it's probably the most important one you should think about using. You're looking at L-theanine dose, you're looking at sort of 10 to 20 milligrams per 10 pounds of body weight. And that can be given twice daily. It's super safe. You can give it long term. Give it for a month to see if it's helping. Secondly, there's a, a milk-based product supplement. It's available on Amazon, very popular in Europe, called Zilkeen, Z-Y-L-K-E-N-E. -E. I'll put a link under the video. Um, I've had a lot of pet owners write in and say they've found it be helpful, specific for these dogs that have anxiety. Um, third, um, look at doing some acupressure. Probably the most important point, sort of right in here, right in, I'll show you here on, okay, no, too low. So right in here, so right here at the base of our eyes, just at the top of our muzzle, top of our nose. So right there. Um, anytime we're dealing with anxiety, that's the best spot you're going to press. Hold that for 30 seconds, you know, right while you're before you're going to start the vehicle or anytime that anxiety is popping up. I find a lot of guys re really respond well to that, that sort of acupressure point. And the last one I really like is T-Touch. We're making sort of these circular motions. <laughs> Good girl, Tula. On the, on the ear tips. Um, so you might find here, it's so just your thumb, your index finger, your forefinger, these gentle, gentle circular motions. A lot of guys are really respond well to that too. And then the last one for our guys that are, you know, especially being, we're dealing with travel sickness, being in a vehicle, um, is gravel. We're looking at doses of you know, a quarter of a 50 milligram tablet per 10 pounds of body weight, and that can be given every eight hours. The next couple questions, they come from C Cindy here, and they also come from Adrian. Cindy is asking me, I'd appreciate any info you can give me on Cushing's disease. My 16-year-old cockapoo was recently diagnosed with it. Thanks. And Adrian is asking me, how often should I get my 12-year-old Shih Tzu for the, her Cushing's disease test? I'll call the ACTH stim test. So, great question. So, first of all, what is Cushing's disease? It's hyperadrenal corticism. Um, your dog's body is producing too much of a hormone called cortisol. And it's, it's produced from this gland located just in front of their kidney. It's called the adrenal gland. Um, it can cause a whole bunch of secondary signs and symptoms. Most typically we get these guys who come into the vet practice because they're drinking more water, going to the bathroom more often. You get kind of older, generally small breed dogs. Little Tula would be sort of a classic one. Um, but typically sort of after the age of 10. They can get this distended pot belly, they can also lose hair. It can also lead to a host of secondary um, changes within the body, these metabolic changes because of the high cortisol. That's the biggest sign. They're drinking all this water, they're peeing everywhere, just not right. So first of all, do you need to treat your dog? If you've got a 16-year-old dog, if they're really, really extreme symptoms, okay. If they're just mild, a moderate amount of drinking, a moderate amount of urination, I'd be looking at some of the alternative options. Um, the second question was how often you need to do the, the monitoring. Generally in practice I did that once a year. Um, some veterinarians are su suggesting more often. That's really up to you. As far as treating Cushing's disease, um, there's a couple of newer, there's one new conventional option called trilostane. 
Um, I started to use it in practice and some pretty happy pet owners, minimal side effects. That's a real serious option. As far as a holistic or natural option, many things have been tried. It's pretty difficult to treat, to decrease, you know, production of those, you know, that adrenal, adrenal gland that's producing too much cortisol. The one thing that I read that was shown to be effective is high enough doses of oral curcumin. So the 95, but it's a 95% curcuminoids. And that's a doses of 100 milligrams per 10 pounds of body weight given twice daily. Um, the big thing is that enough of it needs to be absorbed to make its way there to suppress uh, cortisol production. So you need to be giving it with food and in particular with fat so then it can be bound and be absorbed. But that's a real sort of natural type option and one I, I would definitely consider if I were to have a middle-aged older dog that was diagnosed with Cushing's disease, symptoms aren't super serious, I would try that first before I would go towards the conventional options. The next question, it comes here from Ellen. She goes, what would cause my dog to have sporadic urinary incontinence at night in her sleep where she wakes up in a pool of almost colorless urine? Um, great question. Uh, first of all, the majority of our dogs that have incontinence are, are spayed female dogs. And most of the time we're calling it estrogen responsive incontinence. Meaning they've been spayed, they've lost those ovaries, which are a source of estrogen. And that's key for a number of dogs for them to be continent, which means in, involuntary when they're asleep, that urinary sphincter is supposed to stay closed and not sort of loosely open up and leak urine. Um, but in some cases we've spayed our dogs and that can be the result. Um, in many of the guys, you need to go to something conventional to sort of get that sphincter back tight again. In some guys, you can look at the plant type estrogens. Those are the, that can actually help sort of make that sphincter a little bit tighter. A real good source for that is in ground flax. You're getting ground flax seed. You grind that up, grind that up in a coffee grinder. You're giving that to your dog orally twice a day. You're looking at about a teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight twice daily. Um, so that's a real good option. Soy is another uh, good source of plant estrogens. There may be something else going on. So it's, it's never not a bad idea to one, get a veterinary exam, at the very least start with your analysis um, and get a sense to, to see if, is it one related to perhaps something such as diabetes, perhaps liver disease, perhaps kidney disease, and or uh, urinary tract infection. And our last question today comes from Marcel. It says, I have an 11 month old toy poodle and I've never managed to cure her yeasty ears. Um, despite many vet visits and I've been given both colloidal silver and 1% dex at different times. She's itchy all over and never, never stops itching. First of all, thanks for the question, Marcel. And secondly, I can sort of feel your, the frustration of sort of having this really itchy dog recurring ear infections. What are the, some, some of the sort of holistic type options that I would consider have you look at, at doing? First of all, knowing that recurring ear infections are likely related to an underlying allergy. So secondly, you know, go through the basic steps. If you haven't done a proper food trial, do a proper food trial. Eliminate everything else, eat a unique type protein and a unique type carbohydrate for a minimum of eight weeks. See if that's gonna be beneficial. Next, you need to do high doses of the essential fatty acids or treating the underlying allergy. At 1,000 milligrams per 10 pounds of body weight daily, you can do something like flax oil. For your little dog, you know, a teaspoon of flax oil twice a day. Third, when we've got these big allergy flare-ups, you need to control that inflammation, all that itching. You can look at doing some type of antihistamine. I really get, like Benadryl is a real good option for many of our dogs. It's one I often use in veterinary practice, and it's available for you, you guys to use. Um, third, fourth, some of the holistic type options, liquor's tincture, and, which I've got some of it here, that would be the one that is sort of considered the natural type steroid. And we're looking at tincture doses. We're looking at about a quarter of the tincture, so about a quarter up to about a quarter of the dropper full. Um, that's a, so it's about that much. A quarter of a dropper full per 10 pounds of body weight twice daily. When we're dealing with those yeast ear infections though, the big a couple big things I suggest. First of all, I really like um, how well apple cider vinegar will work against yeast. Um, the big thing you need to do is give it in a diluted form, so in about a 10% concentration. Um, in one of the videos, I actually show how to do it, uh, an apple cider vinegar green tea mix mixture. So we're doing about nine parts green tea, 10, 10 so one part apple cider vinegar. Um, and then you're flushing that into your dog's ear, rubbing the base of the ear really well, you know, something like here on Tula. 
um, using like a Q-tip on the edge, getting as much of that debris out. Um, you even just use a cotton ball. And what we want to do is start by doing that twice a day for five to seven days and then once a week for maintenance. And the other option that I find works really well for our dogs that have recurring yeast infections uh, is using like something like topical monostat. Um, so it, it's an antifungal meant for people, but that in particular, that works really well for yeast. And it's got the antifungal that is many of the veterinary medications, it's called clotrimazole. Um, so you can just get that as an over-the-counter cream, a lot less inexpensive than having these ear medications from your veterinarian. So there's a two, those are the two options I really like for treating the yeast ear infections. So thank you guys for watching this edition, this Q&A edition of Veterinary Secrets. If you've yet to do so, I encourage you to click down there to like this video, click up there to subscribe to my channel, and lastly, I'd love it if you click directly in the box below and then when you sign up for my newsletter, I can send you my free books, my free videos on how to heal your pets at home with my top natural remedy.